How many of you have it in your heart? The prayer of your heart is, God, I'm ready for a, for a mighty movement. I'm ready, for, I'm ready for you to begin to stir as in the days of old. I'm ready for you to shake. Uh, when I say that, I'm thinking about Acts chapter 4 and verse 31 when they had prayed the place was shaken and they began to move out and speak the word of God with boldness. Well, I'm going to tell you something. The Bible tells me that God never changes. That he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Who changes? We do. Well, I want to I have the heart of God. I, I want to, I want to, I want God's heart to be important to me. What is important to God? What is near and dear to the heart of God? I want that to be near and dear to my heart. As far as I can tell, that is the only way that we're going to have a move of God, that we're going to see the Lord do things in our midst that we dream of. So his heart is our mission. We've got to discover what that is. We've got to know what the heart of God is. I believe that every believer is a minister. Every person who sits here today who believes in the Lord Jesus Christ, every person here who, who is saved and has asked Jesus into their life, you are now a minister of the gospel. There's a story that I read years ago about a little village, a mountain village that sat nestled in a, in, a, in a small valley amongst the mountains. And they enjoyed flesh, fresh flowing water coming from the mountain streams coming into their village. They had a small village government and they, they saw to the needs of the, of the little town and administered the finances. They had a, they, they levied a small amount of taxes. They received money into the into the uh, county coffers, and then they administered it. One of the things on the on the uh, list of items that the that the tax funds paid for was the keeper of the springs. This was a guy that lived up in the mountains, and every year he would go around and he would he would make his rounds through the mountains, and he would clear the debris, the leaves and the limbs that, that may have fallen into the small, tiny mountain streams. He would keep them clear so that so that the streams could flow freely, eventually forming the small river that ran through town. Flesh flowing water. Well, Economic times got a little bit tough, and the city council met, and they began to look over the, the budgetary items to try to figure what can we do away with? Where is there uh, some, some waste? And they were looking over every item, and somebody spoke up and said, what about this keeper of the springs? Why do we pay him? What's he doing? Then somebody said, well, he's the guy that, that clears out the springs up in the mountain. And somebody else spoke up and said, well, you know what? That's not necessary. They'll take care of themselves. We never see him. We never hear from him except to collect his paycheck. We need to cut out the keeper of the springs. That's one area where we can save some money. And so another seconded and said, that's a great idea. We don't know this guy. He doesn't show up. We don't see him around town, so let's cut him out of the budget. And they took a vote, and it passed unanimously, and they cut out the budget for the keeper of the springs. Word was sent to the man that kept the springs and the mountains clear. He was let go, and so he quit doing his job. Didn't take long before the springs began to dry up, be, they began to be diverted elsewhere and the water did not flow freely through the stream that flowed through town. The water was diminished and it began to sour and they began to have a problem on their hands. City council met and said, we've got a problem with the water. What are we going to do? We've got a water problem. What, what is going on with the water? And somebody said, maybe that keeper of the springs was more important than we thought. 
Well, I'm going to tell you what. We've got to do what is necessary to keep the springs of God flowing. It may take some sacrifice. It may take some effort. But we've got to do what we need to do to keep the springs flowing clearly. You know what we do is we tend to show up like a reservoir. We want to get filled up so that we can take it home and, and enjoy the water for ourselves. But God never intended for us to be a reservoir. We ourselves are the keepers of the springs. We've got to keep the springs of the living water of God flowing clearly. Do you know what that is? That is the gospel message that flows through you and me. Can I give you a little hint here? The dryness that you feel. Sometimes the absence of God that you experience is most often, more often than not, that you are not ministering the Word of God. Amen. You want to have joy in your life? You've got to give in order to give. You want to see God working in your life? You've got to give in order to give. You cannot outgive God. You cannot outgive God. God loves a cheerful giver. I'm not talking about just money, but let's talk about money. I believe that every believer is a minister. I believe that every believer is a soul winner. What do you think about that? Every believer is a soul winner. Well, at least intended to be. God expects you to be a soul winner. Well, preacher, that's your job. All right? I'll tell you what. I'll make a deal with you. Show it to me in the book, and I'll believe that. Show me where the preacher's the only soul winner in the crowd, and we'll go with it. Mm -hmm. But that's not what my Bible says. What does your Bible say? God has called us to spread the gospel. In Jerusalem, that's Bible talk, and that's the Bible word. In, 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 in good old we wall English, we would say it. it's our job to spread the gospel in we wall. He said in Jerusalem and Judea, in Bible talk and in we wall talk, that would be Gulf County. In Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria, well, that would be St. Joe. Don't tell us. But really, I mean, he's talking about a, an outlying area, another town. And to the utmost parts of the earth, he said for us to go. And you know what? When we are not in the gospel sharing business, the springs get clogged up. It's our job. We are soul winners. I believe that every believer is a missionary. Soul winners are missionaries. You know what? We are to be involved in missions work. Our district superintendent, last year, late last year, we elected a new district superintendent. Now, a lot of y'all are real familiar with Assemblies of God ways, but we've got people from other churches that go to church here now, people from other denominations. So bear with me for a minute. Let me, let me give you a brief explanation. The Assemblies of God is, a, is the general council, is our, is our national Assemblies of God all together. Our home office is in Springfield, Missouri. And then we're broken down into districts generally by states. But like the state of Florida has two districts, the, the Panhandle and the Peninsula. We're the, we're the Panhandle. We call ourselves the West Florida District. And we go from, I think, somewhere around Cross City and, and from there up north uh, through, through um, no, not Jacksonville, um, Oh, Live Oak and uh, anyways, straight north of you know. It breaks off somewhere on the other side of Tallahassee over there on the other side of Madison County and all that. Anyways, the, the Panhandle of Florida. And, and we're, the, we're the West Florida District. We, we have a new superintendent over our churches for the West Florida District. Last year, Brother Tommy Moore. He's a few years younger than me. He is full of fire and enthusiasm. And they pastor him and his wife, Pastor uh, a little bitty church out from um, Bonifay called Carmel Assembly of God. Uh, Carmel Assembly of God is located in a territory something like Dalkeith Baptist Church. You're driving down the road, going, going down the Dalkeith Road, and you're driving along, and you look to your right, and there's a beautiful little white church, just like
like you would expect to see. Amen? Nice church, nice people. We love the people from Dalkey. They're good Christian brothers and sisters of ours. And so we use them for an example because Carmel Assembly of God sits out from Bonifay, really further from Bonifay than Dalkey Baptist is from Weewalk. And you're driving along a little country road and you see cows and you see farms and you see a house every now and then. And all of a sudden on your left hand side there's this little bitty, well actually it's a humongous, a, a tremendous, humongous church out in the middle of nowhere. Out in the middle of nowhere, y'all. Their church will seat about 500. They got plans to build another one that will seat, I don't know how many. And people come from Alabama, Bonifay, and places all around. And you know what they said? They said it's because they're magicians and minded in the church. They said it's because they have given great emphasis to missions. Not only in their church, but in their personal lives. And they say that God blesses them. And, and uh, Sister Nisi Moore, Tommy's wife, said if you get missions right, God will take care of everything. Else. I believe that we are the missionaries. And so I want to challenge you to get involved in missions. And that is on a regular basis. We make a contribution through this church to missions. We have it in our hearts to do greater things than we've ever done before for missions. We, uh, we have several programs that we do missions through. Every age group in our church has a missions program. For children, it's BGMC, Boys and Girls Missionary uh, Challenge. And their money that they receive, every bit of it goes to missionaries to help with projects that missionaries are doing. The missionaries cannot do what they're called to do without BGMC. Our, our teenagers raise money for Speed the Light. Their missions program is called Speed the Light. And the money that missionaries that, that missionaries get from Speed the Light, they purchase vehicles with them. We've been supporting a, um, a missionary for several years now, a single lady by the name of Bethany Moore. And she is, she is ministering in a... Um, I can't say a whole lot about her her uh, her work, but it's in a, it's in a very restricted area that is not that is not kind to the gospel, uh, that is not open to the gospel. So she has to be very careful. But um, our Speed the Light program just bought her a a vehicle, and she sent an email to the churches that are supporting her, thanking us for the vehicle that we bought, and she was giving some of the details of the things that she's doing with it. And so our teenagers raise money to help missionaries buy vehicles. Another program that we have is called Light for the Lost. And that's where it's primarily intended to be a men's program. But our church kind of does it as a, as a church. And we're going to be making more emphasis on Light for the Lost the rest of this year. And I'll tell you why in a minute. But they use Light for the Lost monies to primarily purchase literature for our missionaries to be able to use on the field. And then our WMs have a have a women's missionary missions ministry program, women's missions, women's ministry, and um, they raise money and um, and that's given to missionaries for various things. And then we um, also support missionaries for their living expenses and their working expenses. So there's a lot of different ways that we support missionaries. Well, back during uh, the month of April, Pam and I were invited to go to a missions conference over in Georgia, and our church, Pam and I were invited specifically because our church has given a, a, a great deal of money in the last several years to through the BGMC program, the Boys and Girls Missionary Challenge. We're, we're averaging probably a little over $5,000 a year that we give to them. And so they invited us. They said, you, your church is very good with BGMC. Your church is, is doing well with missions, and we have a special project we'd like to invite you to be a part of. And so we went and attended a conference. It was great. It was motivational. But what it was about is there is a small country in Southeast Asia called Burma. Um, it's also called Miramar. And I, I still haven't done the research to figure out why this country has two names. I'll find that out and I'll let you know. But the gospel has been outlawed in Burma for the past 40 years or so. And they, but the underground church, the, the church 
not not literally underground. Do you understand what I mean when I say the underground church? They're kind of doing it as incognito as they can. But they're having church and their church is growing. Their churches are growing. There are many thousands of churches in Burma and thousands of pastors. But they have very little Christian material to work with. And so I went out on a limb. We, we generally give about $5,000 a year through our Boys and Girls Missions Program. And so we told them, we'll give $5,000 again this year. That's not a limb because we've been doing that. Everybody that's in favor of Brother Joey being the pastor from now on, Jesus <laughs> Okay, good. We're, we're glad for that. I told them that our church would give $10,000 through Life for the Lost to help the little nation of Burma. I don't have $10,000, and you don't have $10,000. But among us and through us, God's going to Amen. 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 We do. And so we've got from now to the end of the year. Now let me tell you, that's on top of everything else we've been doing. Our church generally gives a little over $30,000 a year to missions. I see that growth. I see that increasing. As we help people in foreign lands receive the gospel, hear about the gospel, as we help people in the United States, not all of our missionary money, not all of our missions money goes overseas. A lot of it stays, and I don't, I don't know how to tell you how much I can really figure it out or kind of put a, 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 a guesstimate on it, but I've never done that. But a portion of it stays here in the United States. And then we do a lot of what I call mission work right here through, through our vacation Bible school and our, and our other programs that we do, trying to attract kids to come to the church so that we can share the gospel. Our men's breakfast, get the guys to come. We had a great men's breakfast this morning, didn't we? Had a great turnout. All right, so. Our heart, our mission is to do the heart of God. And that is for us to be ministers of the gospel, for us to be soul winners, for us to be missionaries, doing what God has called us to do. Now I'm going to preach, all right? I love you. You love Jesus, say amen. amen. I want to invite you to turn your Bible to 1 Peter chapter 5. The title of the message today is, He Cares for You. God cares for you. He cares for you. I don't know what you know or what you need to know today. But I believe that God impressed upon my heart this past week that there would be people here this morning that needs to know that God cares. Maybe, maybe most of you, maybe all of you already know that, but I don't, I don't believe that all of you are convinced. And some of you today need to know, in spite of the things that you see going on around you and the things going on in your life, you need to know that God knows your name and that He cares for you. In the Bible, in 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 6, 7, and 8, this is what the Bible says. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that He may exalt you in due time. Casting all who cares upon him, for he cares for you. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Father, Lord, we need to know that you care for us today. We're asking today and we're believing that you will minister right here to hearts and lives, to people in this place. Pray God that there will be a spirit of encouragement to move among us just now over these next few minutes. We thank you for it, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. It begins with humbling ourselves under the mighty hand of God. God is all-powerful. We have a word that says that He is all-powerful, and that is that He is... Um, all power. What is that word? Omniscient, omnipresent, omnipotent. That's the word I'm looking for. Omnipotent. Thank you, sweetheart. 
is all powerful. God has created. He has everything that exists. He created. He gave His Son to die on the cross so that He could redeem us. It is necessary that we be humble before God. Even when we don't understand what's going on in the world. Even when we don't understand what's going on in our lives. We must never, ever, ever lose sight of the fact that God is omnipotent. He is all-powerful. He holds the universe. Not just the earth. Not just the sun and the moon and the stars. But the entire galaxies of the universe. He simply holds them in His hands. We are like dust to Him. This world is like dust to him. In other words, he's so powerful that he can just sit there and hold everything in his hand. Why then should we not humble ourselves before God? We must understand that he is all powerful, but he is also all loving. Not only does he hold the universe in his hand, not only does he have the ability to crush us into oblivion even as we speak, but he loves us and he holds us gently and delicately in his hands. There are things that happen, there are things that go on that we cannot explain, yet we must humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God. In due time, he'll lift you up out of the despair, in the discouragement. Because as this passage will tell us, God's got this. He knows. He's got it. And he says then, we should cast all of our cares upon him because he cares for us. I'm going to read some scripture to you. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 10. And, and I realize the time. I'm going to make sure you come with me right here. I'm going to take a break. Matthew chapter 10, verses 29 through 31. Oh, I'll tell you 
you want your more than a speck of dust that God who cares for you. Listen to Pam sings this old song, His Eyes on the Sparrow.
Canaan, she was a Canaanite. She was a foreigner. She was someone that typically the Jewish people did not associate with. And she told him, my daughter is severely demon-possessed. But he didn't answer her. He ignored her. She kept pressing. Lord, my daughter is demon-possessed. Will you help her? And he told her, I was not sent to your people. He said, I was sent to the Jewish people. And she kept on insisting, Lord, help. And he told her, he said, it is not appropriate. It is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the little dogs. And she said, yes, Lord, yet even the little dogs eat the crumbs which fall from their master's table. Jesus answered and said, O woman, great is your faith. Let it be to you as you desire. And her daughter was healed from that very hour. He cared for her. He was teaching her, he was teaching people in that time that he cared for everyone, not just the Jewish people. He shared a story and he said, a man has a hundred sheep and one of them goes astray. He said that man will leave the hundred sheep, the ninety-nine sheep, and he'll go out and he'll find the little lost lamb. And when that little lamb is found, he will come and he will call his neighbors together for a celebration. And he'll say, come and rejoice with me because my sheep was lost. But now it's found he cares for the little lambs he cares for you. Today, I don't know what you're going through or what you feel. But today, if you need to know that God cares for you, I'm here to tell you that he does. His eye is on the sparrow. And I know that he watches me. Will you bow your heads for this morning? God, thank you for your great love. Thank you for your caring towards us. We know that you love us. God, to be honest, sometimes we let that fact slip away from us. Sometimes we get distraught. We despair. We worry. We sorrow. God, right now, we need to come back to you and know that you love us and that you care for us. Right where you're sitting right now this morning. In the midst of your life, if there are trials and troubles, and maybe no one else is expressing care for you. Maybe no one else is telling you that you are loved. Know the day that God loves you. There's a church family here. We'll do our best to love you. But more than anything, you need to know that God loves you and He cares for you. Sitting here today, whether whether you know it or not, you are loved. You are cared for. God cares.
is if you have accepted and believed in Jesus Christ as your Savior. That's all. If you've not done that, come right now. Don't wait. You need to be saved today. Today is the day of salvation. Don't let today pass until you have given your heart over to Jesus. Oh, Lord.